George Kane did more than change the way higher education managed their portfolios and then built up their endowments to help scholarships across the country. He revolutionized it. He literally changed the future of educational investment in this country. He was a family-oriented community person. George was a wonderful combination of visionary and humanist. He was always very generous and um, whenever there was need, he responded to it. George Kane came from modest means. Born to Irish and German immigrants in the factory town of Danbury, Connecticut in October of 1929, at the beginning of the Great Depression. He walked from the family home at 18 Grand Street to Catholic School across from the family church, St. Peter's on Main Street. Many of the people who went here in the early days, the end of their education was the eighth grade. And so that was the religious teaching that would last them through their lives. You were your brother's keeper. You were to keep within the moral framework that you were so carefully schooled through. Everything that happened in our lives that was like a community was St. Peter's church itself, the building, to me, was like a cathedral. It was huge. And it still feels that way whenever I go in there. It just feels very uh, sacred. George was educated in the Jesuit tradition. He would graduate from St. Peter's, attend the Jesuit-run Fairfield College Preparatory School, and eventually would attend the brand new Fairfield University as part of the all-male first graduating class of 1951. People like George, they helped fashion the university. Not only were they recipients of a Jesuit education here at Fairfield, but George had the instinct and desire to put his talents and his resources uh, and his energies back into making sure that a Fairfield education would be strong, dynamic, responsive, and available. A man of extraordinary competence, uh, of exceptional compassion, and of, uh, of widespread commitment for the good. An alum who comes away, as George did, with that understanding of the importance of service and exemplifies it in various ways in his life, that's really being consistent with what values Fairfield would have tried to inculcate at the time. He would be the first in his family to graduate college. After graduating from Fairfield University, George went on to attend the University of Pennsylvania, where he would meet his first wife, Winifred. They both loved to sing. They would have three children together, Brian, Jeffrey, and Sheila. A new father and fresh out of college, George Kane drove to the Berkshires, looking for work. He spent the night in a hotel and woke up across the street from the Berkshire Life Insurance Company in Lenox, Massachusetts, who hired him on the spot. It wasn't long before his work was noticed by TIAA Kreff, who hired him to come work for them in New York, managing teachers' retirement pensions. He moved the family to the commuter town of Westport, Connecticut in 1958, my father was very involved with us when we were kids. He took us fishing. He was a little league coach. He took us on trips across the country one time. My father picked up the guitar uh, at one point. Uh, he was really into uh, folk music of the era. And he and my mother tried to force me and my brother and sister into being Peter, Paul, and Mary the second. Of course, I didn't really do the kind of music that they liked. I used my paper route money to 
buy my first electric guitar, much to their horror, and started playing in rock and roll bands. So began the era of the generation gap in our family. When I was growing up, um, my father used to um, sing all the time. He would sing um, when he was doing the dishes. He had a song for everything. And when he would answer the door, if there was a party going on, he would be singing because that's what happened at parties. My mom and he would sing. And he wouldn't stop the song. He'd just keep on singing, you know, open the door and welcome people and you know, gesture them in. But uh, he was just full of song. He had a lovely tenor voice. You could just melt listening to him. George Kane worked his way up the ladder at TIAA Cref and would rise to become highly influential and respected in the financial world. In 1970, George would spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C., shepherding new legislation through Congress that would prove to revolutionize philanthropic investing in America, and then founding the nonprofit Common Fund on a Ford Foundation grant based on the legislation he had seen through. It was the first nonprofit strategic investment firm for the benefit of higher education in America. In his work with the Ford Foundation of working to pass and get the Institutional Management of Funds Act, he was a driver, a catalyst, and an important leader in the initiative to advance the investment management practices of nonprofits. George would meet his second wife, Renee Bacall, in Westport, Connecticut. They were married in 1983. The Common Fund was growing with its success, and in the 1980s moved its headquarters to Reef Road in Fairfield, Connecticut. It is fair to say that George Keene made my firm possible, and that made my career possible. George was somebody I called off a long list of institutional investors, and he picked up the phone, and he set me up, and he raised uh, $82 million for me to manage, and he said, go get it. Um, I never worked so hard in my life. Well, I met George in uh, October of 1985. Uh, I was managing a company called TSA Capital Management. George was my third client at TSA and my very first client at First Quadrant, an important part of my own career and my own successes. As your introduction mentioned, endowment funds are a perpetual source of support for colleges, so they can take a very long-term time horizon. George would help establish a new index fund with research affiliates of California worth over $150 billion today, and served on the boards of numerous companies and philanthropic organizations, including the board of his alma mater, Fairfield University. With his background, when he came on the board, it was a natural that he would go on the board's finance committee. This is a world that truly needs the kind of education that Fairfield provides. I know he was a Fairfield University graduate, and I think one of the, the, the Jesuit uh, principles is to be of service to the world, to be of service to people. We also raised money for the Archdiocese of New York when Cardinal O'Connor was the presiding cardinal. We used to run a boat ride in a very elegant yacht around Manhattan Island. The Cardinal would be on board. We asked George if he would be the honoree. We invited all of the money managers and they couldn't give money fast enough. And so within two hours, we raised a few hundred thousand dollars for the inner city schools. He was presented with two honorary doctorates and many awards for his service, including the Frederick D. Patterson Award for his service as the treasurer of the United Negro College Fund for more than a decade. Ever expanding, the Common Fund moved to Westport, Connecticut in the new George F. Kane Building in 1990. There were very few women in investments during those years, and if they did have jobs, they were not 
doing asset allocation, investment management, things like that. George gave all of the women that worked at the Common Fund full range to develop in all the areas of investments. And he created the first daycare center in our office in Fairfield. One of the few people doing that in the beginning and all the women that worked there, we were allowed to bring our children. Back then, that was a very unique thing for a CEO to do. And it gave me a picture of the kind of individual he was, and it built the loyalty of all of the people that worked for him. One of the wonderful parts about George was that he encouraged all of us to be together as human beings, not just professional worker bees. And we had a personal relationship with each other. George retired from the Common Fund in 1993 as President Emeritus. In 2021, the Common Fund reached its 50th year, employing hundreds of people, advising over 1,500 institutions, with $27 billion under management. There'll always be people out there chasing that quick buck. Some will succeed, most will fail. Common Fund doesn't believe in that at all. It's not part of our DNA, you know, and our DNA traces our lineage back to George. Though George continued to serve on many boards of directors, he always made time for his family and friends. George and Renee became world travelers. They built a house in Tucson, Arizona. A few years later, in 1997, they built a house in University Park, Sarasota, Florida. It was still the outskirts of town then, with cattle across the street. George was a generous patron of the arts and a sports enthusiast. He lived well, ate well, and loved well. He didn't golf very well, but had fun at that too, as the world's most generous scorekeeper. We would play once a week, in which George kept score, which meant we all got pars the whole 18 holes and we would have lunch together, which of course George would insist on paying for, like he did on everything. He was a really generous human being and a lot of fun to be with. There's one thing I can say about George among many of his characteristics. He didn't take himself too seriously, but when he did commit to something, you knew that it was 100%, whether it was supporting the Sarasota World Affairs Council or just in a friendship, he was always there for you. A great human being really, uh, and terribly missed around here. In October of 2019, the family organized a 90th birthday for my father. We rented a large hall and filled it with family and friends and admirers. He was singing his signature song, One More Time. father and I each had success in very different worlds, but we never lost touch, nor did we ever lose the deep bond of love that we had for each other. He had a long and remarkable life, and he touched the lives of many along the way. When I went to George's house in um, Sarasota, Florida, he had 
an amazing bust of St. Francis in his home. It was absolutely beautiful. And I did speak to him about it. And it's, it's a beautiful prayer. It's just the epitome of being a humble person and giving of yourself. When we think of George, he was important in our family. He was a gentle man. I never heard George speak ill of anybody. And I, I just loved him. I thought he was a beautiful guy. George Kane's final celebration was in the same church he attended as a boy, St. Peter's on Main Street in Danbury. George had come home. I had the opportunity at the end of the, of the Eucharist to say something about how important George Kane had been to us not only uh, for what he had done for us, but in the sense in which he, he exemplified what we hoped a Fairfield graduate would be. George lived every word in that prayer, professionally and personally. And I think that's why my heart feels so connected to George Kane. Everything that he stood for, everything that he did was wonderful. I am honored to be a part of this video for the George Kane Scholarship Fund at Fairfield University.